Andre Leontali, thank you for coming on the I'm show. I'm very happy to be here with you, Tom. It's a pleasure to have you. So uh, I really enjoyed watching the documentary about you. Your interest in fashion sparked in Durham, North Carolina. When twelve, you were 12 years old, you were looking over every issue of Vogue. Yes. What, what was it about Vogue that appealed to you back then? It was my escape hatch because I grew up in a very humble uh, home with my grandmother and my great-grandmother. I lived with them. From a very young age, I was the only child in the household besides two women of great power and style, and we were very humble. We were no means poor. We were not on welfare. My grandmother was made. My great-grandmother had retired and sold all her property uh, for $2,000 in the country to live with her eldest daughter, and um, I just had unconditional love. And I, I learned to read and loved to read, and I loved reading Vogue, and I discovered Vogue in an early age, and it was my escape land. It was my world of escape on Sunday afternoons. Where, where, where did you escape to? Where did it take you? It took me to the world of Diana Vreeland and the world of travel, Virushka. It took me to the world of Naomi Sims and Pat Cleveland and Halston and Irving Penn, one of the great photographers, and Horse P. Horse. It took me to the world of fashion photography, literature, Truman Capote, Udora Welty, all of these things. Um, I just gravitated towards it at a very young age. And it was Vogue, and also when I was in high school, I depended on a great deal, on the great, great, great... A book of the late, great John Fairchild, who was one of my first bosses at Women's Wear Daily, called The Fashionable Savages, which is in the uh, documentary. And I read some chapters about Mrs. Vreeland in, from that yeah, book. Yeah. And Mr. Fairchild was a great boss. Mrs. Vreeland taught me the luxury of clothes from the inside. Mr. Fairchild taught me how to write and analyze clothes as a reporter. And Mrs. Vreeland also, you said, made the, the culture of fashion come alive to you. Yes. What did you did. mean by that? She created narratives. She just didn't say, describe clothes. She created stories behind each dress. She would give you a picture, a mental word picture. She wouldn't say, Andre, uh, when, my first job, I was a volunteer at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. Yeah. And her, the show was romantic and glamorous Hollywood design in 1974. Yeah. And one of my first tasks was to uh, install for Mrs. Vreeland to approve, final approval, a costume of Claudette Colbert from, I think, the 1939 black and white version of Cleopatra with dresses by Adrian. It was a stunning, stunning uh, production. And the dress was a fluid by a silk lame, silk lame, because in those days, the finest fabrics were used for the film. And it was a gorgeous dress. And Mrs. Vreeland said to me, she called me into office, and she gave me a full-on short story about who this queen was who wore this lame dress in the movie. And she made Cleopatra come alive. She was a teenage queen. And she, she said to me, now, you're dressing Cleopatra. She's a teenage queen. She's a queen, but she's a teenager. And she's in Alexandra, and she's in the most beautiful palace. And she spends all day in the sun, and she's trailed by her white albino peacocks. Pause. Now get cracking, Andre. That's the assignment. <laughs> Did you ever get intimidated or scared? Were you always scared? insecure? I'm insecure to this day. I'm very insecure. I'm very unsure of what is going on. I mean, when I'm especially when I'm exhausted, I'm I'm very insecure. The armor, my confidence is armor and grace. I have gone through the world at the age of 68 through the confidence I put on my armor before I go out of the house every morning. My armor is my knowledge, as I say, Judge Judy, quote. With apologies to Judge Judy, they don't keep me here for my looks. They keep me here because of my knowledge. Right. And I put on my armor of knowledge and my armor of, of style and clothes, and that gives you the confidence to go and face the world. I, I, I arrived in Paris to be the editor-in-chief of, um, the editor of, Vo of Women's Wear Daily at a very young age. In 1978, in January, I arrived with 13 pieces of unmatched luggage. I would say now I have about 50 pieces of matched Vuitton hard suitcases in my house in North Carolina. But when I arrived with 13 pieces of unmatched luggage, I was the most insecure person. I was afraid. I didn't know what I was getting into. And I always can overcome the fear. How? Grace, the grace. Well, where does that come from? Like, I, I want to know if you're listening to this right now and you have, you have fear, people might learn something from you. Like, what, the grace, what can they the do? confidence, the inner strength, the inner spirit. <clears throat> you know, I, I believe I have a great faith from my grandmother, the faith of my ancestors, or the shoulders. I'm walking on the shoulders of my ancestors, my great grandmother, my uncles, my aunts, who had such great style with very little money. I learned about style in the church. And there I learned grace, and grace can get you through life. You know, uh, grace is 
something can, you can forgive my fatigue. I can forgive my fatigue. I have to plow through these interviews, and I try to do it with as much electricity as I can. You're, you're, you're doing grace, so. Grace, grace. And so, you know, when I'm going to go and I'm going to say, Grace, I, thank you, thank you, God. This is grace that's getting me through this. Is, is fashion spiritual for you? Well, it can be spiritual because it is, um, you, you have to know the people who make the fashion and where they come from. So you, 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 they, you find people that you can associate with. I love the great late Yves Saint Laurent. And he was a man of grace. He gave me once a cross made out of raffia. It was one of his favorite things. And his partner, the late Pierre Berger, just passed away last evening, and he was a giant and a genius. You, you gravitate towards people that you are bond and you feel you have the same values. Uh, I just saw this amazing film at the TIFF, Grace Jones. Mm -hmm. It was Wagnerian. It was a Wagnerian. It was a ring in a two-hour film. It was Act One, Act Two, and Act Three. Grace, the spirituality of Grace from her Jamaican upbringing, her mother in the church, her fathers were ministers. Grace can also be just the strength you find within your own confidence to get up, smile, and get ahead. What is your grace? How did you get here today? What's keeping you going? Um, what's keeping me going is a quest for truth. I think. Okay, well, let's keep going. You'll find it. With you me. know. Yeah. But you know, I, and I want to talk about that truth. I, I, one line that stuck out to me in the documentary, as you said, you think we have, it was a very quick line. You said, I think we have a moral code to dress well. We do have a moral well, code. Tell me more about that. We have a moral code to dress well, to present your, your best, you put your best, we used to say at home, you put your best foot forward. So when you're going out to meet the world, you are supposed to present according to your expense account or your budget. What you can afford within your budget, you must do the best you possibly can. That could be a pair of 30-year-old shoes, polished to perfection, polished so, so polished that you can see your reflection in the shine. Well, so what, what, what does that give us deeper than what we're wearing? It gives you a sense of power and empowerment because someone will admire your beautifully polished shoes. So many men walk around today, especially those hedge fund people on Wall Street. Those men are running around with those thin gym bodies and those little natty uh, pencil slim suits and on their cell phones. And sometimes they have on the wrong shoe, the wrong color. You don't wear brown shoes with navy blue suits. You wear brown shoes with gray suits or black suits. And you, they've got the wrong color and they haven't polished their shoes. Polish is everything. I learned it from my grandmother and Mrs. Vreeland. Polish is everything. You polish everything. And that is a metaphor. Polish can be what you, you scrub your floor. You have the best possible sheets. You can buy your sheets at Zara and they... You just you have the best sheets and you can just keep them clean. Everything is polished. Just about. I hope I've polished my articulation of who I am on your radio well, show. Well, I, I, I want to go. I want to go back to that because you grew up in, in. I should say not just North Carolina, not just Durham, North Carolina, but segregated Durham, North yes, Carolina. Yes, yes. And one of the one of the more powerful moments that I began to understand your mm -hmm, journey as well mm -hmm, as I could watching mm -hmm, this documentary mm -hmm. was the desire and the need to, to dress, get out of Durham to dress as fine as you could yeah. on Sundays at church. Church was our lives. Church was the absolute core of life. And to dress well at church meant something. It was symbolic. It was more yes, than just putting on nice yes, clothes. Yes, it was symbolic. You know, we had to represent as people. We represented, as I think, you know, <clears throat> Kate shows that brilliantly in the documentary and her research, the Joe Bell hat store that it was on Main Street that my grandmother went to and threw hats down when they asked her to put a tissue paper in the linings because she was a black woman, and they didn't ask that to do to the white women. And the way church people, she has images, archival images, of people in church on Sunday, best hats, best coats. The people didn't have a lot of money, but they did the best they could for Sunday clothes. The most important clothes in our household were the Sunday clothes. There was a ritual to laying them out. They were laid out, picked on Saturday, washed shirts to ironed, starch was cooked on the stoves. Mm -hmm. We used to have starch that was boiled on the stove when you did the white shirts, and the, the shirts were starched like cardboard. Do you see a continuation between the clothes you were laying out for your Sunday clothes for church in Durham, and, North Carolina, of course, of course. and the clothes you put together for spreads in Vogue? Of course, Vogue? of course. What are, what's, the, what's the correlation? The, the best the impeccability of the thought of the clothing in Vogue. Uh, you know, of course, all the editors in Vogue do that. And all editors in Vogue have a sense of some sense of value and grace. The great, great Tony Goodman, the great Grace Cottington, uh, they do the same thing. They, they were brought up in a certain world, perhaps a waspy world, a rarefied world, but they continue the values that they learned in their early youth, and it carries over in their work. You mentioned waspy. Best standards, high standards. You only want to achieve the best standards. You must live up to high expectations. 
I speak with Andre Leon Talley, former editor at the American Vogue, the subject of a new documentary called The Gospel, according to Andre Leon Talley. And I find it so interesting that you say a waspy world because you work in an industry that has not always featured people of color prominently or proportionately. I just got back from looking at the Urban Pen uh, exhibit at mm-hmm. the at, at mm-hmm. the Met in, in, in New York, yeah. and I noticed that as well. Coming up in the fashion industry in the 70s and 80s, what barriers did you face as a black person in fashion? I didn't think of any barriers because I just think that I had something unique to offer, and as I repeat myself, it was knowledge. People gravitated towards me because when I spoke, I spoke with knowledge. When I went into the fashion world, I think people were very attracted to me because they thought I was exotic, because I was very tall and then very skinny. And now that I look back on the pictures, very attractive (laughs) and very handsome. I look back on the pictures and I get so depressed. I said, please don't show me another picture of me when I was 27 because I was like a pencil, number five lead pencil. People, when I opened my mouth, I knew what I was talking. I didn't just say frivolous things. I never felt that I couldn't meet in a conversation with the best of them. Carl Lagerfeld, Deanna Vreeland, Giorgio Santangelo, Calvin Klein, all the designers, Halston, Halston. Did you feel like you had to work twice as hard? No. I didn't think about it. I just, I lived. I was me. I just, just, I'm me. I just, I, I've read a lot, and I thank God I love to read, and I, I've maintained that kind of knowledge, and I've retained knowledge through memory. And when I was young, I was very fascinated by the literature of Paris and the Balzac and Gustave Flaubert. Madame Bovary was the first consumer, the first great consumer in fiction, in French fiction. So Madame Bovary impressed me because she was, as I, she gravitated towards Paris. And Paris, you have to. It's the mecca of fashion and style. So you have to get to Paris some point in your life if you want to be in fashion. But I do want to point out there are one of the more powerful moments of the documentary is the moment where you do you do talk about some of the comments people have made about you. And, oh, and, yes, when they called me Queen Kong or something. Well, you know. t- tell me about that. I mean, are, Well, the, I, I didn't know that the, the, the lady called me Queen Kong until uh, I left Paris, and they, they said, you know, they used to call you Queen Kong. And I thought, well, that's just so negative and, and awful. Uh, it, it, it was racist, Queen Kong. Uh, just is, is it better now? Yes, it is better now, but it's not perfect. It is much better what now. What needs to be done? Well, do you see that many women of diversity in the pages of magazines? Certainly you do in Vogue, but do you see that many women in advertising campaigns on television? How many women do you see in movies that are not uh, playing a role of Miss Daisy or something? Do you see? I mean, who is the glamour star today? Halle Berry, is she? Uh, the, the most glamorous person is Beyonce. Uh, Beyonce yeah. uh, she's not a movie star, but she's a high diva in her own world, in the music world and entertainment world. Rihanna and Beyonce are the queens. And Michelle Obama is reigning, reigning queen of style. And this is because they achieve through their empowerment and their independence as strong women. So therefore, they become the women that are role models for all of us, for everybody, every woman, every kind, every human kind. I think that it's a global world today. It's a multicultural world. And when I was coming up, it was not that way. I mean, the reason that I loved Vogue so much is when I first saw Naomi Sims in Vogue and Pat Cleveland in Vogue in the 70s by Irving Penn. And I saw Princess Elizabeth of Toro photographed in Vogue in the main well of the book. I thought, this is the world I want to be- see because this is a world of interest yeah. and it's a multicultural world and it's a world of diversity. Uh, we, have to, we have to let you go. I have one more question for you. Mm-hmm. And I want to thank you. You've been so generous with your time. Thank you. I only read my first copy of Vogue six months ago. Well, that's your loss. I know. And I've, I've, I've become so enamored with it. And between that, that and watching this documentary, I'm seeing fashion now from a completely different yes, perspective of course, than I did. Fashion. Fashion. As, as, a, as a folk musician, I didn't necessarily see it that way. For those, <laughs> for those of us who don't think that fashion is for us, so there's going to be people listening to us who think that right now. Is there something that every human can gain from being more in touch with fashion? Every human can gain fashion. It can get you up the stairs or down the stairs in the morning. How? It is the way you present yourself. As I said, it's a moral code to dress beautifully. Fashion, whether you're a musician, whether you're a professor. A plumber. A plumber, yes. The right jean, the right T-shirt, the right sweatshirt. Fashion is a part of your everyday fabric of life. Fashion is as important as the food you 
digest and take. It's as important as the reading, the read things you read. Why? Fashion, fashion has always been since the moment that the world began. Adam and Eve, you know, there was a fig leaf, the loincloth of the, the of the prehistoric man. Uh, fashion. It, everybody in the 18th century, the 17th century, the 16th century, even in the medieval times, there was fashion. Fashion can keep you warm. When the castles were cold, those British royals were wearing heavy, heavy, heavy clothes. You know, fashion in the 18th century was light. There was a lightness of being. It was suggested something that was refined. Fashion just makes you feel good about yourself. That's the most important thing. And I'm glad that you discovered it six months ago in Vogue because I'm sure you feel much better now, don't you? I do. Good. Andre Leontali, thank you for thank coming in. Thank you for in. having me. I really appreciate it. Appreciate it too. Thank, thank you. you so much.